Issue 138. In this issue, we're back to the art quality 134, sadly, and it starts out with the king being a horrible control freak complaining about Sally actually being useful going on a vital mission, purely because he didn't order to. I thought he was supposed to have gotten over that horrible flaw. Then Sally irritates me by not appreciating Sonic standing up for her, calling her dad a grouch. I mean, just because she broke up with Sonic doesn't mean she should be ungrateful. After Sally snaps him furiously to stop caring and reminds him that they're broken up because she doesn't want Sonic playing hero, god, that's something a villain would say, we see the king and queen leaving for their world tour. Uncle Chuck will come with them as a science advisor that I don't see why they would need, since they're not doing anything science related, and Patch, who's apparently a lieutenant now, will command their elite guard. While a lot of other people are dancing, Sonic complains to Knuckles and Julie that Sally's being impossible. I like how Julie laughs after Sonic points out how useless Knuckles is for losing his powers, even if that is disloyal for her to do, since Knuckles is obviously going to be very sensitive about that. Specifically, Sonic points out that really Julie would have more of an excuse to forbid her boyfriend from going out to fight the battles than Sally with him, because as he puts it, amusingly enough for her to laugh, I mean, sure, he can't glide anymore, he's as weak as a kitten and pretty much good for nothing, but still. Surprisingly, a fight doesn't break out from that, and instead, a crashing sound is heard, and we hear Charmy and his fiance weakly begging them for help and passing out, I guess. Why does the crashing sound come from that? After Charmy receives medical attention, he tells Sally that Eggman finally set his egg pond to attack Golden Hive Colony, their home. So they lost everything. My question is, why didn't that happen a lot earlier? Why was it even around for Charmy to return to? The very fact that this just now happened is laughable. Charmy also explained that he couldn't find any survivors of their country, losing his entire family in the process. So now he's back to being an orphan like you'd expect him to be from the games. After Sally shows sympathy and looking horrified, a guard awkwardly interrupts saying that they're receiving a garbled transmission on the techni- on the Technolo tree for Knuckles. Fortunately, the message is nice enough to only go static in the unimportant parts of the message, allowing them to explain that Locke is being held prisoner on Angel Island. After Sally insists on the Chaotix and Knuckles only going to the island to rescue Locke because I guess she has no faith in them to liberate Angel Island like would be the more righteous thing to do, Sonic asserts he's going on the mission whether she likes it or not, to which she surprisingly allows him to go, but expects a full report when he returns. Why is Knuckles so mad at him? He just stood up for him and volunteers to assure his mission's success. And it was a while ago since he insulted him. If anything, he should be thanking Sonic. But God forbid he insults Sally. On the airship to Angel Island, Knuckles asks Charmy if he's sure about coming with them to help on the mission. And Bunny, after naturally asking why she can't come with them on the mission since she's a badass cyborg, is told that Sally needs to keep some muscle and not hold while he's gone. And they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket. That's really logical and smart of Sonic. They all jump out of the airship, slowing their descent to the ground with stuff like parachutes in Charmy's flight. Knuckles bury their parachutes, and Sonic does high-speed reconnaissance in the blink of an eye and with a super speed before Knuckles can even finish his sentence, taking advantage of super speed. And this causes him to find a prison camp run by teched-out dingoes. After a feeble attempt at a joke, everyone charges at the dingoes, one of which, the Colonel, is shown to have an electrified sword. What happened to General Striker, by the way? Is he, like, are we ever gonna see him again? Sonic uses his super speed to steal the weapons of Dingoes. I totally get why these people would willingly work for Eggman, since not only do they want to do anything to spite the Echidnas after their past history with them, but I'm sure most people on the planet would be too afraid to oppose him in any way and would just want to avoid making him mad. Especially since most people don't have superpowers like Sonic does to be able to fight him. That's not to say they don't hate him. I'm sure they genuinely want him taken down and hate his ruining the planet as much as Sonic does. They're just forced to be villains by circumstance. At least I hope that's always going to be the explanation for Mobians working for Eggman. Right now, them hating him is only implied. After Knuckles gets attacked and ungratefully lies to Sonic that he could have handled the dingo he fought off himself, a crowd of echidnas who are annoyingly monochrome seem to worship Knuckles as the Avatar including Constable Remington, who seems to act out of character for a normally very serious person but being way too admiring of him. I'd like to point out that this story isn't by Ken Panders at all. So, Knuckles is told that when he first came back from the dead, Remington thought he was an imposter, and it wasn't until he visited his shrine at Sky Sanctuary with his security team 
not sure what the point is of clarifying that it's an echidna security team, that he saw the truth. Knuckles' body was gone from the tomb, but it was too late. The Dingles had already sold the Echidnas out in exchange for their own freedom, and Echidna Opalus was invaded by Eggman. Since when is there an O before Polis and Echidna Polis? They do the same thing with Megal Polis. Remington had been in a dungeon for months before he would wind up here. Remington hugs Knuckles and a crying Julie, who explains that the Echidnas had faith in the prophecy of the ancient walkers they somehow knew about, that a hero would come back from the dead. For some weird reason, Knuckles says that he thinks they've got the wrong Echidna. I know he's creeped out from all the warship, I would be too, but they obviously haven't made a mistake here. Meanwhile, Eggman is told that the prisoner hasn't cracked yet and he wants Master Emerald, which he somehow still hasn't found, even after owning Dryland for like a year. Compare this to the games where he would have found it right away because it's so poorly hidden. Of course, Locke is the prisoner and he's being threatened to try to make him talk. The heroes are in Lava Reef Zone, since that's where the transmission came from. And they notice a bunch of figures moving in the smoke, which turned out to be Dark Legion goons. So, uh, why didn't the Dark Legion take down Eggman since he's a rival to their goal for world conquest? I can't understand why they would logically work together, because, I mean, why would that make sense? Why wouldn't the Dark Legion just take back Angel Island for themselves? I know they both love technology, but Eggman can't be trusted. The only logical explanation I could think of to them working together would be that they're just using each other and playing the facts at each other, but why didn't they just do that a long time ago then? In the next story, 25 years later in another dimension, while Sonic is playing with the kids throwing a ball around a pool, Julie and Sally complain about how Sonic and Knuckles hate traveling to go socialize with each other, even though Sonic should logically be all for that. Then Sally explains how out of character Sonic's gotten. Apparently, he now rarely talks to anyone beyond those he has to deal with. And in the ultimate betrayal, he hasn't even spoken to Tails in three years. When Tails took off to move down under, Sonic didn't even show up at the transport center to say goodbye. First off, move down under? Is he going to try to move the entire continent? Second, why are Tails' eyelids white? And third, most importantly, Sonic shunning Tails like the most neglectful brother and parental figure in the world would only make the remotest bit of sense if they had a huge fight and now hate each other. Like, maybe Tails snapped at Sonic for spending all his time with Sally and neglecting him. But that sounds a lot more like something his evil twin would do. Sonic's supposed to be better than that. After briefly dunking Manic under the water because he hasn't let him at the ball all day, Sonic is called out on by Knuckles, who says the great line, From overthrowing evil dictators to dunking helpless children? Naturally, Manic is offended at being called helpless. I do like the idea of Sonic starting to lose his morality, I, th I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me, since the main thing separating him from Scourge is no Eggman to fight. He hasn't had a villain to fight in 25 years. But still, this is unusual for him. Knuckles says that he doesn't do water as an explanation for why he hasn't shown up to the party yet. That just makes me remember that Sonic is normally supposed to be hydrophobic. And Sally even said once that he can't swim. Although, in most of the comic, he can and has no problem with water, which is what the story is logically going with. It's just really weird to see Knuckles the one with the fear of swimming, since he's notable for being one well, of the only characters who can swim in the Sonic games. With everyone at the dinner table, Knuckles for some reason has to remind Julie's servant how everyone wants their meal, even though it should be obvious to her after all the visits their families have had together. Knuckles is called a gourmet for knowing how everyone likes their food, when it shouldn't be just him knowing that. He lampshades Sonic knowing such a big word, and Sonic tells Knuckles he doesn't think he's being responsible for everything that goes on throughout the island. Knuckles tells him that it's because his concerns are more global. Logically, the Guardian should still be focused on Angel Island first because they live there. Anything else would be a betrayal of their roots. Sonic then asks Knuckles, where were you during the Overlander uprising last summer? Knuckles then tells him that he was busy with the drone problem, which contributed to that in the first place. This causes the kids to all leave the room, with Sally, I mean Sonya, promising that they won't all argue when they're older because she'd hate to lose Lyra as a friend. Lyra then threatens to slap Manic Silly for him simply putting his arm around her like a friend, although he did call her baby. Julie shows great annoyance at Sonic and Knuckles arguing and wants them to apologize to their guests. Then after the two both belch, more proof that Sonic isn't really meant to be a king, right after Julie had lectured people about being bad guests, Sally had the gall to tell Julie's servant that she'd always be welcome in her kingdom if she wants a change in scenery. The servant says, Tempting offer, your highness, but this is home. That seals it right there. 
She just offered her friend's servant from another royal family to work with her instead. How is that being a good guess? She's lucky everyone in the room is so fond of her because in any other situation with rich families, that'd be extremely rude. Finally, Knuckles tells Sonic about the impending apocalypse that makes no sense, causing Sonic to simply call him certifiable instead of believing him, going into denial because he's the optimistic type. Knuckles says that Kobar is detected Crusher building at the core of Mobius, and everyone has to solve the problem or it'll be it. Why is everyone freaking out when they could simply get all the Chaos Emeralds and Master Emeralds and solve the problem with magic? Why isn't that their first idea for a solution? This, the core of the planet might blow up things seems so inexplicable. And I thought the problem was with the space-time continuum as a whole. Why is it just one planet that's in danger now and they might need to get everyone off of it? The first story was by Carl Bowlers, and involves, after Charmy's kingdom is left a ghost town, leaving him back to being an orphan like in the games, because Eggman didn't just capture any of the people in the kingdom, or just take it over without killing anyone. Sonic, Julie, and the Chaotix all go to try to free Luck from Eggman and Angel Island because they received a transmission from somebody to go there that was coincidentally only garbled in the unimportant parts of the message. It makes sense that the Dingoes did what they did. I just wish it was more firmly established that any of the Mobians working for Eggman still hate him and want him taken down for what he's doing to the planet and just feel forced to work for him. It makes it more logical that way. The big problems I noticed right away were really minor because they stayed in the very beginning of the story. Sally's drawn as weirdly as she was in the slap with her eyes sometimes, and yells at Sonic for God forbid being a hero because she selfishly doesn't want him to risk his life. All those years of worrying about Sonic's safety would make any worry work crack, but she still looks like kind of a bitch here. Only kind of because it's justified, unlike with when she acts ungrateful for Sonic standing up for her when the king, in the other big problem this issue, ungratefully bitches about Sonic and Sally destroying the fake robot factory because he's a control freak. When he was supposed to have gotten over that around the time Eggman showed up. You know, there was a story arc dedicated to it? Plus, overall, I didn't enjoy this story. I'm not sure why. It just had an appeal problem. I did like Sonic saying Knuckles is weak as a kitten and pretty much good for nothing, in the sense that it was amusing, he actually said that to his face. But it just reminds me of how stupid him losing his powers is. Also, I hated Knuckles being worshipped. So what if he came back from the dead? Heroes do that all the time in the comics. How John blind are these people? And I'd like to point out that Penders didn't write this comic, so the whole Knuckles being worshipped thing? Not his idea. And the second story, which is actually by Ken Penders, is about Sonic and Knuckles' families being together for a visit where they end up talking about the world eventually blowing up from bullshit, where Sonic and Knuckles get into an argument about how Knuckles hasn't been focusing on Angel Island like he would be true to himself anymore. This is after Sally's conversation with Julie. Where it's revealed that Sonic has made the uncharacteristic decision of refusing to socialize with anyone who doesn't have to. In fact, he made the outrageously neglectful decision of not even talking to Tails in three years. Unless they had a horrible fight over this exact kind of neglect, which would explain it well, I can't help but see this as atrociously out of character for Sonic. Sonic and Tails will be best friends for the rest of their lives, age difference or not. Hell, Sonic raised Tails, literally since he was a baby in this continuity. That would be like abandoning his own son! Not only do we see his morality deteriorate by betraying Tails, but he also dumps his son Manic in the pool for a little while to mess with him just because he was keeping the ball away from him at a party. What is he, Fleetway Sonic? Granted, Manic doesn't seem to have an ounce of goodness in his body and comes off as a troublemaker, like a scourge in the making, so I don't blame him for it much, and I can see why Sonic's morality would deteriorate without a villain to fight constantly reaffirming his position as a hero. Now he's not a hero anymore. But still, Sonic has always been shown as exceptionally heroic in the Archie Sonic comic, being the type to idealistically want to save the life of literally anyone. Even Snively, or Robotnik multiple times, or the nerds. Not to mention the fact that he effortlessly forgave his friends for trying to court-martial and exile him once. That kind of person wouldn't ignore and shun his own little brother figure like that out of the blue. So that at least made the story interesting and memorable, getting me invested because of the weird direction they took with Sonic's character. It both makes sense, and it doesn't make sense at the same time. And again, I don't understand why they don't just get all the magical stuff they can find to prevent the world from being destroyed, since it's apparently just the world and not the whole universe now. This is such forced artificial conflict that comes out of nowhere. 